to everybody that is tuning in. We are with the SCA Coaches Corner. Hello, gentlemen. How are you tonight? Hey, Vesper. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you. You're doing okay over here. So yeah. looking forward to the show tonight. I am too. <laughs> oh, this is going to be a good one. One of my favorite topics. Um, well, I'm going to say a couple words just for housekeeping. Uh, for everybody that's watching, by all means, ask questions, ask away, post them in the live comment box. I will be keeping an eye on it and we will try to address all of them before the end of this show. If we cannot, it is not personal. Uh, we are just working within time constraints, so be patient with us. I will also post a link to the SCA Coaches Corner on the page when everything is all wrapped up. So you'll also be able to head over there, get some great information and hang out with some really cool gentlemen and women, everybody. Everyone. All right, everybody. Am I forgetting anything or do you think we're good to go? I think we're good to go. Let's rock. All right, rock let's rock. Out. Yeah, I'm going to disappear off the camera and I am officially handing it off to you all. The loveliest face of all of us and she's going to disappear. I know. Yeah, I know. Not fair. <laughs> so uh, welcome to another session, uh, our, our Friday night sessions from the Coach's Corner. Uh, we uh, put the Coach's Corner together to hopefully help people train, uh, people stay motivated, um, and people to understand our sport better than maybe they have in the past. And I think that's a, in any martial art, that's the, the biggest key. The more you understand, uh, the, the, the better you can be and the better you can be a teacher or a coach to somebody else. So I am Duke Branos out of Middle Kingdom, uh, part of the SCA for 30 plus years now. I uh, have had a chance to train around the world. It's been great. Um, I, I, the best part though lately is and I've uh, been able to be around some great people in Coach's Corner and, and going through a lot of real, real fun subjects. Tonight is our boxing footwork night. Uh, we're going to keep it a little bit simple uh, because uh, it can easily jump into real deep philosophy fast. Uh, and, but we want to make sure we get the basics out there first. Uh, we'll probably have a number of other sessions. I know I already have... Uh, uh, a session I'm working up on uh, how to equate uh, some of Lomachenko's uh, work with uh, with what we do in the SCA. Uh, that one will be coming in the future. Um, but for now, on to the basics. Count Tristan? Uh, I'm Viscount Tristan. I was uh, knighted in 93. I did a lot of years fighting. I love melee, love single combat. Uh, for this discussion, what's relevant is when I was knighted, I really didn't fight Whoop, was that a hold up? Yeah, you were on mute. Oh, was I on mute? Okay. I, okay. Sorry. Uh, I'm Viscount Tristan. I was knighted in 93, uh, fought for 20 some years, almost 30 years, uh, went on to do, uh, start an Aikido dojo. One of the things that's relevant to this discussion is when I was knighted, I did not even own a shield. I didn't pick up a shield until after I was knighted. And I was primarily pole arm and two sword fighter. And this is going to come into this discussion later because of how the footwork related and how the movement related to one or the other. But um, everything Brown has said about the coach's corner about why we're here is to help improve training. One of the things that I found is just the lifeblood of training fighters is getting them to move well and footwork and how they move their body is crucial to their success. And if somebody's frustrated and they come to you and they say, how do I get better? The answer almost always is improve your movement. If you can improve your movement and improve how your feet move your body, you will make them a better fighter. If they're thinking, I just want you to train my, my hands to be faster, you're going to probably wind up telling them you're on the wrong track, buddy. Get your movement down. So that's, that's why this, I think, talk tonight is going to be so important. Can you introduce our other guest? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sir T Award was uh, my squire for, for a number of years. He started out with me a long, long time ago. He was knighted a few years ago, and now I wanted to bring him to the show uh, for this episode because we talked this week, and he's training a number of new fighters, and he's got some really good observations about how to, how to take these footwork concepts and make good fighters good quickly by making sure that they have good footwork underneath all of the other stuff, whether it's the blocking, swords, uh, sword work. Uh, mechanics, all that other stuff, it comes from the footwork. So I wanted to have him here tonight, and we're gonna we're gonna bring him on for for some of his. And T Word, feel free to jump in with anything I missed. Oh, you covered it. <laughs> other than that, I'm old and I've been fighting for a very, very, very long time. Oh, come on, you got to tell us now. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, let's see. I've got, like you, Grace, I've been in the SCA for over 35 years. I've been fighting for about 30, 32 of those. But um, I was one of those that just provide, re relied on natural talent and didn't really spend the time to improve myself because until very, very late into my career. And then he decided to get serious. Then I decided to get serious and it, and it paid off. Yep. So I got, I got a question for you since you're, uh, uh, you know, working with a bunch of new people. What do you mm -hmm. think, uh, how, how is your learning now that you're actually teaching others some of this stuff? I know, I know on my side, it's incredibly, I mean, I, I learned so much from teaching. It's amazing. Absolutely. Um, I've, I've always said, if you want to learn something really well, teach it. Um, I like his Grace Eliyahu, I've taught college. And so you, when you're teaching something, you have to know it to s such a different level. And it also freshens your mind and you take a view on it and it makes you think it's like, oh, how did you do that shot? You know, I don't really know. I just did it. Now I have to break it all down. And then to teach it, you have to start them at the basics and work your way back up. Yep. So I, I, I guess I threw that at you mostly because, again, this, that's kind of why we started the show. And that's why I'm really excited to have you on the show, because you're at that level where um, uh, you're, you're getting this opportunity to become a better coach like every day. Right. You know, type yes. of deal. And uh, I think it's an amazing gift to give to others. Uh, it's a gift they give to you. And uh, I look forward to uh, hearing some more stuff you have to say. And uh, I think and on that, Tristan, uh, do you want to give us a little uh, start on what we'll be covering tonight? Yeah. Uh, one of the basic things that I found is one of the, probably the most useful tool is the basic steps of how do you get from one place to the other quickly with no telegraph, uh, uh, very suddenly. And I want to use the word suddenly very carefully because speed uh, usually is interpreted as somebody traveling at a very high velocity. It, within a fighting context, sudden movement, even though it's not fast, is perceived as being very fast. So, but they're very, very different. And one of the basic steps that uh, I did a little video up on is the drop step. And this was something that Jack Dempsey used. He talked about it in his book, Championship Boxing, which I would highly recommend that book for anybody that wants to learn about movement and about delivering power. Uh, the, the drop step is, is such an asset for any type of martial artist, including SCA fighters. And it has two primary uh, benefits. Uh, and we'll get into that more, more in a little detail. There's also the spring step, which he talked about, and I put that in a video as well. And it, this is one of those things where Within, within the SCA, my experience was everybody says footwork is so important. It's such a fundamental. It's, it, it's almost the word footwork is like a cliche. Everybody says, yes, it's important. But then you say, you ask them, tell me about your footwork. And they kind of just, people stammer and they're like, I don't even know what you're, I can't. Footwork's important. They just rely on that. Like, well, you better be able to describe what exactly is important that you need to be able to do. What are the tangible things you can teach somebody that walks up to you? They don't know anything. You say, teach me some footwork. You have to be able to show them tangible things. And in my opinion, the, the drop step, the spring step, the pendulum step, uh, some of those are very, very basic. And they will, if you can do those things well, you, everything you build above that is going to work. It has a chance of working very well. If your footwork is crappy, no amount of fast hands or, or strength of your shoulders or chest is going to make up for that. It's going to have to, but it's going to be risky. So building your footwork is building the foundation for the house. So that's kind of the approach that we're going to take tonight. We're going to start just kind of simply and sort of build up. Well, so, you know what? Let's, uh, I, I know we were going to fit uh, yours in a little bit later. We'll, we'll, yeah. let's, uh, let's kind of feather yours in later. Uh, yeah. let, but let's stop with, uh, start with that drop step that you're talking about. Okay. I know I've watched it. I'd like to okay. see it again and get sure. a clear explanation. Yeah, so here's the explanation of the drop step. I am just getting our video player ready. 
It never lets me set this up before we actually share the screen. I was that's just right. saying. We, we work around like, the tech. I know, right? That's just not fair that it doesn't do that. Okay, so we're going to the drop step. Here we are. Do is keep our weight here and just pick up the foot in the direction that we want to go and the body will fall there. In order for this to work, your knees can't be up and locked. Your knees have to be bent a little bit. And now from here, when you pick up the foot, you'll just fall that direction. It's much faster. Hard to tell the difference of how fast it is, and we're gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate that here in a second. Before I do that, I wanna cover one basic concept, and that is balance. So if you stand this way, and I want you to try this, if you stand with the weight evenly on the Actually, balls of your feet, feet, balls of your feet and heels. Jump back to, I wanna show the, the segment that shows how people normally start walking. Certain direction. Before so I get a little bit of that, I wanna show how different this is from how we normally move. So when somebody goes from standing, and you can watch this all over the place, when they go from standing to, to walking, here's what happens. And I exaggerate a little bit, but the basic principle is that they shift their body onto one foot, so their weight's here, that, that means they can lift this foot up to step and fall, and then they start walking, which is just a series of controlled falls. Now, we practice this every day, so this is our ingrained habit. When we want to get out, out, of, out of the line of an attack or off the line of an attack, we try to do that same movement really fast. So if I want to go to the left, I shift to the right, and I try to jump that way. And the faster and faster we go, we think, well, it's going to succeed because we're going to do that same inefficient motion quicker. And that's not true. Instead, rather than shifting the opposite direction where I want to go and then stepping, what we really want to do is keep our weight here and just pick up the foot in the direction that we want to go and the body will fall there. In order for this to work, your knees can't be up and locked. Your knees have to be bent a little bit. And now from here, when you pick up the foot, you'll just fall that direction. It's much faster. Hard to tell the difference of how fast it is. And we're gonna, I'm going to demonstrate that here in a second. Before I do that, I want to cover one basic concept, and that is balance. Can you pause so, it. Pause it. Pause it. If you go ahead. Oh, what I wanted to say here is that 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 one trait of shift of seeing somebody shift onto the opposite foot to go the direct uh, direction opposite they wanted to go, you're going to see that as a bad habit all over the place. I see it in martial arts dojos. I, wa I watch karate people do it. I watch SCA fighters do it. It's one of those things that, that is so deeply programmed into people that they just think if I do that really super fast, it'll work, but it never does. And it's, it's difficult to reprogram that. But once it does, you have a suddenness of movement that's really important. And now this this sequence about the balance point is another thing that you're going to see in a lot of people that they do very poorly on a mat like this. And I wanted to include the, the footage to show my feet and toes. I want you to watch my toes when I shift back, watch how they lift up. Now, if you watch SCA fighters, they're in boots. You can't see their feet, but you can, if you really get a sense for their balance, you'll be able to see when they're back on their heels. So watch for this as we go through this segment, go ahead and hit it. You stand this way, and I want you to try this. If you stand with the weight evenly on the ball of your feet, balls of your feet and your heels, I call this balance neutral. So this is kind of how most people tend to stand, generally. If you rock your weight back onto your heels, so there's only maybe 20% of the weight on the balls of your feet, I call this balance negative, and this feels very tipsy. You're very unstable here. What I want to point out from this point is if you rock back and now put 80% of the weight on the balls of your feet, this is balanced positive. This is a very good mobile fighting position. From here, you can shift and move in all kinds of directions. How this applies to the drop step is this. If you start with balance neutral and you pick up a foot, you'll move exactly sideways. Now, same foot position. If you shift to weight on your heels or balance negative and you pick up a foot, now you'll fall back. So you're gonna change the angle of your movement based on that posture. So now if you go balance positive, you're on the balls of your feet, you pick them up, and now you're gonna go forward a little bit. Now this is very useful because we don't wanna be changing our feet around and that dictates exactly where our body's gonna go. We can alter it by where our body position and shift is. So if you're in a front stance like this, you would think normally, if I pick a foot up, I'm going in the, exactly in the direction of that foot. 
But if you sit back just a little bit, you pick it up, you can go straight sideways. So now you have a lot of flexibility in the direction that you can go. This is what I saw Branis teaching when he came to Chicago and taught, taught the drill. And I kind of plagiarized a bit of that by how he would maneuver very slight shift of his hips. But when he picked a foot up, he would go a direction based on where that hip shift was, if that makes sense. And I tried to describe it in the cleanest possible way to people that had no idea about any about how footwork worked or how balance or posture worked, and to be able to describe it. Because this is when you want to go somewhere, you need to be able to choose that direction and be able to, with a slight shift and slight foot movement, be able to go there. And if you notice this video, my upper body posture does not change. Now, if you're a boxer and you're only wearing trunks and, and shoes, you can change your body posture all over the place. You can be very agile. Think of a Mike Tyson, uh, somebody who's going to use head bobs and ducks and weaves and all that kind of stuff. In armor, that's very difficult to do. You want to keep pretty good posture because it takes so much energy to, to go down and come up again. But that's why I wanted to explain it this way. And maybe this is a point to pause and we can comment on, on uh, these basics of moving your body to a new place by using the drop step. Yeah, actually, uh, right, right in the beginning of your video, I, you know, you're, you're covering points that I was going to bring up, uh, you know, uh, going to kind of cover some points on different stances, um, going to cover, you know, basic issues that a lot of people fall into. And, uh, but you, you covered a couple of them. One, one of the biggest piece and uh, probably the number one piece is balance. Um, uh, a lot of people really don't even understand the balance in their own body and, and to make sure that that balance is there. It's a, it's a practice thing and you have to be able to, to move your body smoothly instead of falling or leaning and things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, we talk about stacking the body. We, we, uh, I, I part of, we even talked about this the other day watching, we did a fight review, uh, great fighters of YouTube on Tuesday nights. Uh, and lots of great fighters from around the SCA there. And, they, and you can see that the, when a fighter's fighting that, that balance their, their body is straight up and down. Right. And then, and, and all of that balance is there for them to, to leverage from, because as soon as you lean in, mm -hmm. you lose balance. Right. Um, as soon as you lean out or your shoulders go back, you lose balance. So, so those are really just small pieces to try to keep that body straight up and down, just like a tree. Uh, and that becomes, you know, a, a big part of, of, of balance. And another thing that is inside of balance is, is what you're doing in your stance. So if you have a narrow stance, you lose that balance because it's easy to fall either way. If you have a wide stance, then you also lose balance. You, you have a, a, a harder attachment to the ground, mm -hmm. but your balance, you're not actually using balance anymore. You're, you're kind of stuck. Right. And so you have to find that comfortable place where you're, you can use your body, your body can move and you can control balance and fall onto those feet and be comfortable in any stance you do. If, if you're not practicing that, then you can't expect to do it. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, that, that, that's one of those, those pieces you were talking about and, uh, you know, came right off, you know, right away it, it, it started in your video. I'm like, hey, this is a good start, you know, a good place to go. Uh, and because uh, it was a topic I was going to cover uh, and, and that balance piece, and you're doing a wonderful job and I'm looking forward to more of this is, is really, really critical um, because there's also inside balance, there's rhythm. Mm -hmm. And, and rhythm is when you're transitioning from one place to the other, being in a place that you're still in balance. Mm -hmm. So there's, if your rhythm is kind of out and you're, you're, you're like, okay, I'm going to go over here. Okay. Now you're leaning, you're, you're falling into that space, but there's no rhythm there. That rhythm is like, I'm going to slide into that space. So I'm going to go ahead and push my whole body. You know, when you do that drop step, if you look in your video, mm -hmm. you absolutely don't lean into that front foot. Right. Right. Your body's nice and straight. Your, your body energy, your, 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 you know, that center is taking you onto that front foot. Right. That way, all your angles of attack and defense are still the same. And this is, I, I think, one of those traps that younger fighters fall into is when they, when they face an opponent and they think, I need to reach a little farther. I'm going to bring my shoulders forward, but I'm going to leave my hips behind me. I'm yeah. going to leave my feet behind me and I'm just going to lean over and reach a little bit. 
and it's the biggest trap in, in an experienced fighter. And I used to wait for people to make that mistake because as soon as they lean forward, just like you said before we started this, if your weight plants on your front foot and when you lean over, it certainly plants on the front foot. Now you can't move that foot. Exactly. You're, you're planted, you're leaned over, you're reaching out. I've got movement and you don't. Who's going who's gonna to have the advantage? That's, and that's the advantage. The, the one, and this is where I'm a huge Rommel fan. When he talked about warfare, he said maneuverability is the key. So mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if you're on land or on sea. The ability of where, where you can get your forces, where you can get your offense, that is everything. Mobility is everything in terms of combat. And so the more fundamentals that I see echoed in different types of combat, the more that is a universal fundamental. It's a universal principle that is that applies to everything. And movement is one of those things. Um, the, I'm seeing from Vesper that we have a question. Okay. Maybe we should yeah, let's go. Let somebody launch a question in here. All right. Question time. So Let, lay it on us. We love I'm it. laying it on you. I'm just going to read it to you. Um, the question it starts this way. I've been recording myself doing pal work. Normally, I put most of my weight on my heels, and one of the things I've been working on is trying to put more of my weight on the balls of my feet. However, I feel like it's making things worse for me, not better. Any ideas what I'm doing wrong? So I was actually going to cover this, Uh and Tristan, I'm going to jump on top of this for a second, and then you can kind of... So the other thing you brought up is be careful. You have to bend your knees because balance comes in that bend right? Um, but what happens, people stand straight up, they tend to be flat footed. And if you're flat footed, you lose the ability to twist and, and shift your, your power and your motion in the, in the ball of your foot. And, you know, it, the, the big piece there is, uh, and you can go to almost any boxing video and, and, and talking about, uh, you know, movement or any, almost anything talking about movement. And, and it's not that you're not on your heel. So don't, it is, your heel can touch the ground, but that real connection should be on the balls of your feet. Later, it has almost, you know, as, as you get better and better, you'll find that it's on the ball of your foot. And then at the end of the blow, it, your toes actually grab. Mm-hmm. Um, and as toes that your toes act as your balance point to control that balance. Mm-hmm. But the, you know, the, the big piece is there, there's, the exercise that you're doing, uh, you know, right now being flat footed and maybe a little bit shifted onto your heels feels good because depending on how you're throwing a blow. So if you're throwing rotational blows, you probably don't have to worry too much about it. But as soon as you're trying to stack, stack all the power through your body and it's coming straight out and this, you're stacking all the bones, then that, that, that hip also to get the hip to turn into that stack, you have to pivot on that ball of your foot and so that's where why that becomes important and that that's and that pivot is the part that really grinds into the ground and creates that power um I, what i would say is uh I, I we're all happy to help review and, and take a look at, at what you're throwing i have a number of videos i'd be happy to give you some links out to some of my uh, um, uh videos that i haven't actually presented yet uh that have some breakdown of how to throw even like leg shots and, and, and head shots. And it's all about twisting that hip and the balls of your feet. So uh, I, I think some of that comes into what you're throwing. Um, and then the next piece is don't worry about all that power and that line up right away. Worry about just being relaxed and, and throwing that and letting the body flow. And then later you can tighten that body through the flow to create the burst of energy at the end of the flow. And that's where you'll start really to be like, oh, this is exactly how it's supposed to be done. And that, that, that lineup of all of that power coming through, it's, it's, there's a ton of little pieces that get you there and it's very difficult. But as you learn each piece and you can start lining up each piece, at the end, you create something that's beautiful. Yeah. One of the things that, and I, and I haven't seen any video, I, I would just like Brian, if you wanna throw something up, it helps us get an an indicator of where you might be having the issue. When I've seen people have it, I want to plant the heel issue. Generally planting the heel limits the ability of your hips to turn. And when you run out of hip turn, 
now your shoulder and your chest have to do all the work of throwing the rest of the blow. So regard, and I've just seen the, the uh, I'm a great weapon fighter comment, and this is universal. It doesn't matter what yeah. weapon you're, you're throwing. If your hip, your hip rotation stops, you've run out of power. If you lift your heel, you can turn your hips more. So what I've found as an indicator for power, and this is great for pell work and troubleshooting, why, why am I not delivering power or why am I running out of power is usually hip turn finishes and then the impact happens. Your hips are no longer turning. Your body's no longer turning. All you have is the weight of the sword or how much shoulder muscle you have pushing the sword through the target. If at the moment of impact, your body is in the midst of turning, you're, you can deliver all that power to the target. So this is where you can slow down. You learn so much more on, your, on, on using the Pell or on fighting from moving slowly. This is where you can troubleshoot. Where, where is your power being dissipated? If your hips stop turning and then your impact happens, that's where your power is getting lost. So by lifting that heel, you can keep the, turn, the hip turn going. And that's where at the moment of impact, your hips should be in the middle of turning. If you're going to deliver body, the power from the back leg, through the hips, through the, the kinetic chain, all the way through to the target. And you can do that at, at 10 mile an hour speeds or five mile an hour speeds. That's yep. the best place for you to spot what's happening. If you do it at 80 miles an hour, you're going to, you're going to pound away on your Pell, but you're not going to feel when the hip rotation stops and when you're just using the weight of the sword. The other thing that hip turn gives you is distance. So the, mm -hmm. the other piece of that is if, if you're not able to get a full turn in your hip, uh, then you lose some range. So, mm -hmm. and then that range can be significant. You, you'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I also understand where you're coming from. People feel there's that loss. There's a little bit of that loss of control or what they're really losing is they're losing balance. So, so it's some of the times what happens is you're not comfortable on the balls of your feet, or maybe you're using them too much. So you can start a little bit lower, but you know, work on just turning that foot at the end when you do something and, and line your hip to finish with the sword striking something. And then, you know what, take an extra step back and then try to go a little bit farther. And you can see that your hip has to turn even more so that you can throw something to get that distance. Um, and, and you can start close and then slowly work out and that will help you see how your body, now that distance, don't cover that distance by leaning because as soon as you lean, your hips disengage. Right. So that, be, that becomes a, a huge issue. Mm -hmm. Good one. All right, so I guess we can uh, go on from there. Um, there's a segment that I did on the, uh, the timing and I, and I like having this it, with students or when you're teaching somebody, I've always found that if you can get them to feel the, the difference in speed or in the difference between doing something correctly and doing something incorrectly, when you can get them to feel it, then it's, it's very easy to understand it. And so I, I did a segment in here and I think it's the next segment uh, after the balance postures, which is the speed test um, or the, uh, so Vesper, if you could fire that one up, that segment. Sure. So speed test, step speed test. Yep. So this is, this would be an example of pause for a second. Let me, let me uh, just frame this and say, you'll see the difference. I'm going to show you what it's like. And I, this would be a demonstration that I would show to somebody like, I want you to walk through this. So if you have somebody that can just reach out and touch your chest, uh, you can feel the difference in speed between doing it the wrong way and using the drop step. So here, go ahead and start this sequence up. Or uh, getting a feel for the speed. So Perry, I'm gonna bring him out. I'm gonna put you right here so you can see a bit of the camera. And that is, I'm gonna have a partner start just a little farther away than they could normally touch. So if he reached his hand out, he'd fall short. Yep, but if he leaned or he stepped a little bit, he'd actually touch me. So. From this point, with his hand down, all he's gonna do is reach out at, a, at kind of a normal speed and try to touch me in the chest. I'm gonna use the uh, normal movement that I would use for walking. So when I uh, wanna step offline towards the camera, I'm gonna shift onto the other foot and step. And as he reaches, when I start, yep, there you go. And I'm gonna go, try to go faster, but notice I'm not beating that hand. 
because I'm trying to push off this, load the leg and push off of it. I just don't have time. Now I'm going to do the drop step. So when he reaches out, all right, his hand's touching over on the shoulder, but I don't, I don't mind it touching the shoulder. From here, he's not getting to the chest. This is going to buy you the most amount of time. Thank you, Perry. All right, pause. You can get a few. If you go, and I encourage everybody to go through this because this is such a tangible way for you to feel the difference of shifting onto one leg to try to get off the, off the line. It's a disaster. You just cannot get it to work no matter how fast you try to explode. And you, if you're beating yourself up because you say, well, I can't see the attack coming in time or I don't have the decision speed or I don't have, and we covered this on a previous episode talking about speed. Don't try to fix a problem that can't be fixed by trying to do an incorrect motion faster. Instead, find the correct motion that allows you the efficiency so you don't have to be mentally faster, physically faster. You can see and respond. You do want to have a quick decision speed, but that's all you need. Once you pick up that foot, you'll take your body there in one motion. And the other benefit of this is you're going to use gravity to do it. You're not going to try to use explosive movement, which is exhausting to you because you have to worry about energy management. Remember, your fight could go on for 20 minutes. If you're exploding around like a Mexican jumping bean, somebody else has got better energy management than you are. You're going to gas out and they're going to take you out. So now you need to be able to move very suddenly, very quickly with a minimum amount, minimum amount of energy. And that's where this drop step to me is just like gold. So any comments on, on that observation? I, I think I, I think you're uh, you're you're hitting it nail on the head. I you know I think years ago we we talked a lot about this at a uh, an event or a, actually a practice uh, that I uh, came to to uh, uh, do some teaching at um, and uh, and it was really really nice practice. It was mostly nights there. We we went through techniques. Uh, I showed him how I do stuff. And most of what I do is control for me my control of movements all around center. So what happens is I just I just move my center. I don't stack in one area and push, uh, you know. And you'll see that people always like, you know, how do you run backwards so fast? I I don't drive with my feet to run backwards. I literally act like I'm falling. In other words, I'm just letting my body stay. And and you have to learn to trust yourself. And you and it's something you have to practice. But now I just sit into this empty seat. And you know how you try to catch yourself. Well, I know exactly where that balance point is. And now I'm just falling and I can keep my body straight up and down. Where if you're pushing it to go backwards off your front foot, you tilt, especially your shoulders, you end up doing this, which then you take your hips out of the stack, all your angles are down now, throwing high head angles become different, difficult and your shield is down. So you're creating you know, with a movement, you're creating something that you're not normally in, which is in, which is what we're trying to stay away from. We always want to be, and you know, if I, if all of a sudden I do this, where my 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 butt is a little bit under, but my body stack, then I'm just letting and catching my balance, so I'm comfortably rolling back, and I can throw high head shots, and my shield's still in the right place, and I can do the things I need to do. Uh, and I also can turn at any given point in that thing, change tempo in in my in, in going backwards, um, so that I can escape a, an opponent by by you know increasing or decreasing the speed at which I'm doing it and and changing that tempo. So, you know, be careful when you're like 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 what you're saying. You push off one foot is your opponent sees it, mm -hmm. and it's too late. And uh, and by dropping or shifting that balance onto the other foot. You're just falling into it and catching yourself and then rebalancing your body out so that you're in good balance again. You know, don't, don't stick there. Just you fall into it and then you're, you have a gathering foot, which is not, you know, it's not sliding, you know, it's not dragging along the ground that that foot gathers with the other foot. So if you move one foot, your, your, your forward foot, one foot out, then your, your back foot comes one foot so that you have that same base that you're normally used to fighting on. So, um, no, I think uh, all of those are very good. Um, I, I think it falls right into, I, I do some other things inside of how I move. I, I, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, I, I think for basics, I mean, this is, this is relatively, again, we're talking about a lot about balance in this case, but movement is about balance. If, if you look, 
uh, I happen to be lucky enough to train somebody who's done a lot of dance and she's actually, I've learned that, you know, for them stack, you know, keeping that back straight and stacking the body and putting those hips under you is very, very important in dance because it allows you to move bent knees. You have to have those knees bent. Otherwise your back forms a curve, right. but as soon as you bend those knees and bring your hips under, you're a straight line again. And as soon as you're a straight line, it frees movement up in your body. As soon as you're not, then you lose balance and, and your movement goes away. I think one of the things that uh, people, when you're asked, and, and this is why I want to have T Ward come on tonight because he's uh, he's ha he's working with a group of younger fighters, newer fighters that want are wanting to train him. And one of the things that I remember many many people coming to me over the years going, I think my movement sucks. What do I need to do to fix it? Or watch what I'm doing. I don't know what I, what's going wrong, but something just feels not right this shifting and trying to use like a normal what i showed in the video where you shift under one foot you step the other direction honest to god that was probably 80 percent of what i would see and say this needs to be fixed your movement is is really inefficient and here's how to fix it and this is one of those things that we've talked about you know everybody says footwork is it's like a cliche it needs to be good this is probably one of the first tangible things that that really needs to be addressed. If you want to go left, don't go right first to go left. Fix that. You got that's got to be repaired. And and without that, anything beyond it is just going to be pointless. If somebody says, "Well, I want to learn fancy stuff," well, get the basics first before you're learning trying to learn fancy stuff. Yeah. Um, that would be my advice. In fact, I think this might be a good point to bring T Award in and kind of give his story of. Uh, training some newer fighters and and working from the ground up and and uh, I'll, I'll kind of let you go on it <laughs> yeah well I, it wasn't until very late in my career that I began to realize footwork was very very super important I used to just be a regular athlete just go out there and do your thing but then the older I got the slower I got and the footwork really started to take center stage and I went through a couple of years slightly before I was knighted where I was too broken to fight heavy. So I fought a lot of cut and thrust and that's a touch game. So you got a lot of smooth movement. Footwork really was very, very important. So I started learning that and it was amazing how I should have done this years and years and years ago, how much easier voiding out and, and, doing some sliding over and taking an angle was so much better. So now I am trying to, I took on some minute arms and that's what I'm trying to work them from the beginning. Start with the footwork. Don't wait till the end. And they are um, very, well, they're not really super young, but they're, they're new to fighting. Most of them have only been fighting less than a full year, year and a half. And start with the basics and get them down. And they're, they're pretty good about wanting to do that and understanding why they should do that. Um, and I think this pandemic has really helped, right? Because if we weren't doing pell work and not sparring, we couldn't work on the basics because everybody just really wants to spar, which I'm sure um, Tristan, used to yell at me about that all the time because we do slow work, which would turn into sparring speed in about, I don't know what, about 45 seconds on a, on a good day. So this has really, really helped with that. So, um, and I'm trying to get them to know that the, the power is coming from the ground. It's like, as your grace was saying, you need to be able to have the weight on the balls of your feet because if you got flat footed, you, you can't twist into it. And I came from a baseball softball background. So that last little twist as you hit with the weight on the balls of your feet delivers a lot more power than standing flat footed. So, so that's what we've been working on. And I'm noticing one of one of my guys is um, taking it to heart and he's, he's really getting better pretty quickly. So it's, it's been kind of fun to watch 
actually. And I've been watching you guys on the coach's corner a lot to pick up things and learn how to teach it better. And so it's kind of, it's kind of scary actually being on it with a talking role. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, yeah, that was, I, I actually had two knights come up to me after I was knighted. I was only knighted back in 2016 and say that the reason it was the cut and thrust that got me over the edge. And I was like, well, what was that? And they said, it was because of the footwork. So you, your footwork is really like you were saying, Tristan, is it's the foundation. You need the footwork. Best defense, no be there. You can't move a shield fast enough. Just, and, and the gliding, I, I noticed the other day I was doing some pell work and I just started visualizing a fight and that, that drop step and then the gather as you were saying, Your Grace, it's like, at first, I ended up all stretched out, right? The drop step would go, but I wouldn't gather. And then, then I felt awkward. So then it put in the, okay, drop step, gather. And now I'm, I'm ready for, the, for my opponent to attack me. I've got my defenses all squared away. I'm squared up to him. And the, the sweet thing is I'm now on your flank. I'm almost behind you another little step and I'm behind you and you're not going to deliver much of a blow when I end up on your, on your sword side or behind your sword. So the footwork is, I'm finding it. It's totally an amazing thing and wish I would have done it 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. You live and die by your footwork. Yes. So I think we covered we covered quite a bit there. Um, yeah. Th thanks for that. I mean, I think that's important. I, I you know, here's someone that's starting to see new people uh, that that the training to focus on that thing, which isn't always the the, the most fun thing at practice, you know. Um, but it pays off, and and that's the key uh, to to be a better martial arts. We we can't just go out there and just fight constantly. There are things that we have to do. There's lots of drills out there. You can find uh, in the last show, we talked about drills. I put up a bunch of drills on ladder work. There's rope work, there's sprint work that builds burst and energy, you know, and, and, and speed in your legs. There's head movement slips. There's shift and shuffles that, that help you slide forward and sideways, you know, and then, then the next piece comes the, the some of the best parts and that's creating angles, you know, creating an angle, you know, making sure that you're always in the same place you want to be standing in front of your opponent, no matter, you know, it's like, I want to create an angle. I, I can't hit him because this is the strongest point straight at him, straight at me. This is the strongest point of his offense and defense to pull him one way and then turn him so that now you you're flat on him still perfectly in your perfect form, but he's on an angle gives us a whole different opportunity of shots and it breaks his offense and defense down. So angles become a really, really important part of the game as well. Uh, and we don't talk about that a lot, you know, and, uh, you know, it, so, you know, we'll, we'll give a little bit more talk about that today. And uh, I, I think we probably could, uh, uh, you know, it, I, I'll try to put some more uh, videos out on this post. So of some of the boxing techniques and things they do from the last show we did. And I, I found some more on some, got a whole list of ladder drills that were very good that I found after um, so that if people want to work on those things uh, they can uh, and uh, you know you'll find that like sprinting work builds that that balance and builds that that burst out of your calves and legs and out of the ground and you learn to be on the, the balls of your feet drive and that's what we're doing we're, we're driving from the balls of our feet when we're throwing blows um so you know it, there's lots of ways to help these things i'll we'll try to make sure that we post some of those up so that uh, you can pick and choose the things that might work best for you um so tristan what other things uh you know uh, it, it, let's just talk about a few other things that uh, always get brought up and um uh, uh out of when we talk about movement uh, uh a couple of things i have um you know we hear this all the time uh, and, and it's hard, a little bit hard because I, I cross, cr 
cross my feet all the time, but it's a, don't cross your feet. Right. Mm-hmm. How many, t- how many times you hear that one? Oh yeah. Right. That's huge. Um, yeah. So I think one of the big points is we also have to realize. So as a fundamental, if you're in range and that could be a very long range, but if you're in a range that, that you could be struck, uh, then be careful of crossing your feet because crossing your feet at that point will restrict you. Your opponent can time that and use that to pull you out of balance. And so that's the place you have to be very careful in. Now that doesn't mean that if you're out of range and you're moving outside of range that you can't cross your feet, you can find places to be comfortable. Even later, as you develop better and better, um, footwork and, uh, you know, and balance, you'll find places that you can cross your feet. I, I rarely worry about which, which of my legs is forward and which one isn't. Um, uh, because I can switch inside there because I've done it for so long, but in the beginning, you know, it, it's, it's a lot like you, you see, it's like, okay, I'm just far enough away. I'm going to step and throw Well, on a step and throw you're stepping with your back foot and now you're crossing, you know, you're not crossing side to side, but you're crossing across your front foot a lot of times because you'll step, turn, and your front foot will go in front of the other foot now. Now you get very linear. Your defense just went out the window. And and really, your throw is actually heading off a different angle than necessarily your opponent's upside. So you have to be a little careful on those, those steps. Also, there's a huge amount of telegraph involved in that scenario. So when you get to a point where you want to enter into that combat place with your opponent, start thinking smaller feet. And obviously, Tristan, you have to deal with this all the time in martial arts. We talk about small feet. And you know, so as I get closer and closer to my opponent, I may start with a six inch move to try to get the edge of range moving from very far away. And then it goes to a, to a four inch move to a two inch move until I'm like in that perfect place. And I'm, I'm moving an inch or a half inch down into millimeters. Exactly. (laughs) Right. So, um, you know, and, and I, I think we don't talk about it. I think a lot of people do it. Um, but they're, they're not thinking about it. And, and so if you don't think about that, then we're back when we're training somebody new, they just don't know they're going to step. And there's a lot of times when they step, they step across and then they're in a bad place. Right. Usually do you find when, that. Yeah. Do you when, find that a lot in martial arts. Oh, absolutely. And, and this is something I noticed more in SCA combat because when people do a lot of sparring, you don't see refined footwork generally because it's hard to find good refined trained footwork just because you've done a lot of sparring. You don't, you don't get that out of just going out and, and scrimmaging. Good fundamentals are developed through coaching and, and actual training. And when the SCA, at least, you know, up until fairly recently was lacking a lot of that training aspect, it was just throw your helmet on, go have some fun, go spar and you'll learn to throw them in the deep end of the pool kind of approach. And this is where good fundamentals are very hard to find. And it, you may find one or two, but you won't find most of them. And where I used to see the crossing step happen the most was when two fighters would start to circle each other. And you'd see one step across to, to be able to go into a circle. And I would always watch for that. And granted, most SCA fighters, especially beginners or intermediates, would say, okay, my opponent's there. I'm going to walk straight forward into them. And and just, you know, it's like two fencers on a strip. They just kind of go right at each other. And then you'll get one that kind of figures out, well, maybe that's not the best way because I'm going right into where their attack and their defense is the strongest, just like you mentioned a minute ago. I'm going to start going around. And they, they start circling. And that's where the feet start crossing deep. And as I would see a fighter start to do that, I would start to, as soon as I see that foot crossover, I would press in because I knew that their foot feet were crossed for that second. And by putting pressure, now I put them, put pressure on an awkward position. And, and I found this in, in Aikido, as I started teaching this, a, a great demonstration that showed whatever stance you take, if you draw a line between your heels and extend it out in each direction, if you're on the, on the side of that line where, you, where the toes are, you're in front of somebody. If you're behind that line, you're behind them. So if I, if I have my feet planted this way and say like you, the camera are facing me and I put my heat, my step step over, I've now put you behind me. 
you didn't have to move anywhere. And now you're behind me. I never want an opponent behind me. I really don't want an opponent beside me. But like you said, in terms of basic rules, you don't want to cross your feet. And that beside that rule, there's a little asterisk that says, unless you can get away with it. Every single rule has an exception to it. You have to know when those exceptions can make can work for you, when you can get away with them. And like, like you said, generally you want to avoid it. And what I've found is that the way to avoid that, if you want to circle, is use the pendulum step. Now you don't cross your foot over and put your opponent behind you for a second while you step out and take your new stance in a new location. The pendulum step is probably the biggest reprogramming that goes on in your brain because it is so counterintuitive. And Bronis, you described this, you didn't use the term pendulum step, but I found out later that that's what it's called is when, let's say, I want to go this direction. Instinct says I'm going to use that foot to step, which I call a lunge step. So you step the front foot. Now you're in a really deep stance and then your back foot has to follow you. Instead, you take your back foot, you step to where the front foot is, and then you use that other step to go forward. It's, it's really hard to program that step, but once it starts to click in, you can do that small step repeatedly and you can cover a lot of ground. And now you can circle without ever putting your opponent behind you or, or at a point where they can put pressure on you and you've got your feet crossed and you're now going to get caught in a bad step position. Does that make sense? I think you nailed it on. I, I think you nailed it on the head there. Um, uh, and and I think there's a lot of people out there kind of wondering and and uh, getting a you know you always hear it's like don't cross feet. There's 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 times like you said there's times you can if you're outside of range and you're just walking around it's it's not a huge deal. Mm -hmm. But when you're in tighter, the tighter you get to somebody, the less you ever want to do that. So that's that becomes the critical piece inside of combat. Um, here's another one that, it, and it's not, I'm not going to take this as an advanced topic, although it may, may be a little more than just basics, but there's the, the sink of the hands with the feet. And, and what, what we mean by that is, so when you're executing that drop step, or, you know, it, it could even be the pendulum step, there's a timing in there that you have to figure out to throw a shot. So even on that drop step, if I could do the drop step and then throw a shot, but it, you're behind the time at that point, or I could start throwing the shot, just shot and then fall forward. But now you're actually a little bit behind, you know, your, your, your shots before it, because you're not able to deliver your foot's not on the ground. You're not able to finish that. Um, and that especially goes when we're traveling side to side in, in, in there's times when your feet are coming together and the other one's moving out that there's a space in there that your throw can actually work uh, most effectively. And, and that's where that sinking your feet with your hands becomes, or with your throw becomes very important. And we don't think about it or we don't talk about that much. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, and that's really the, the, the piece there becomes super important later. Um, it's, it's all work to get there. So we've got to learn to walk before we, we learn to move sideways before we, we, we learn to turn our hip before we learn to throw the sword. And then we put all of those pieces together. And, and now we're doing a slide along with, a, 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 as that hip is turning, you know that foot's going to hit the ground, your swords, your shoulder and swords lining up. And then you're pulling your fingers out all at the same time. Bang. It's all in sync. Mm -hmm. The, the, so, you know, understand that that's, that takes time. That takes time and it takes practice to get there. You have to be able to do all of those other pieces. You have to be able to learn to pull that hand and let go and create the angle with your hand and line the body and tying the hip with the arm. Now you're timing your movement with the arm. And we don't spend a lot of time doing that. In fact, we do spend very little time doing that if you, you ask me. And um, uh, there's a lots more drills I've, I've had uh, in the last uh, in the last video I did uh, with Sean on, on uh, drills. Uh, I was showing some pad drills where it was all about learning your motion and setting up those times. And we start with just standing there and throwing perfect shots. And then we start just walking forward and walking backwards and seeing, learning to be comfortable. It's not them fighting me. It's them practicing. 
And I think that becomes a really important part. So movement and, and, uh, and, and sink, sinking your throws becomes su- really, really important at the end. And, and, uh, and that's what we should be really working towards and uh, building the basics, all the basics and putting them together ends in that perfect sink. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's a boxing concept that I came across that, that when I learned it, and I was learning it from a pugilism boxing kind of background, but I said, boy, SCA fighters should understand this. And boxers call it sitting into the punch. Yeah. And that is when you deliver your blow, you let your body rest, sit down just a little bit. It, it allows your knees to bend, allows your body to drop in, use gravity on your side and connect to the ground. I've seen so many SCA fighters that rise up, they go to, they go to strike and they straighten their legs and their hips stop turning and they use just the weight of the sword. And then they wonder, why am I not hitting with power? And it, 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 you could call it footwork, but really it's a body mechanic. And, and if you just think of that phrase, sit into your strike, sit your body down, let gravity be your ally and help your body get into that right mechanic. Um, it's just a very elegant phrase. It's not really related to foot movement, but it's certainly related to where your feet are in relation to your hands. And I like the way you brought us, you described that, the, the, how your hands coordinate with your feet. And it's one of those things that when your brain thinks about hitting with a sword, your brain is, it sees your hand and it, and it pictures the sword and it forgets about everything else from shoulders down. It needs to think about everything about how that body mechanic goes from the ground up. And when you sit down just a little bit, not a lot, just a little bit, you get a whole lot more power and control. You may think for a second, like it immobilizes you. And for just a brief second, it does. But that's where you relax into the shot. You have a moment of tension at the moment of impact, then you relax again, and then you can move again. So there's always a relationship. And this is so crucial to footwork where you wanna be fluid and mobile until that that impact time where you kind of tense up for just an instant and then you release and go back to movement. It's not total fluidity because that's too relaxed when you need that moment of impact, but using your body weight by sinking a little bit is, is really profound. And it works with boxers. They know it, you know, they're taught it repeatedly and we yeah. should be taught it like that. It's all about sinking, you know, sitting into your punch and, and that, you know, and, and, and let's not, um, I don't want to contain movement to the actual idea of our feet having to move because there's head movement. Yeah. Uh, they're sitting. Do you have a up and down movement in your Even body that can movement. change targets yeah. and what? Even helmet movement, which is yeah. something boxers don't have. Like yeah. the structure I mean, you know, of your helmet can yeah. be, you can, can t- yeah. All kinds there's of all stuff. kinds of little movement that we, we make that build the fight. And, and we need to l- learn those movements. A slip is a movement. So mm-hmm. somebody's going to throw something, I'm going to slip under that sword and move into an angle and throw. Or I don't even need to move. I can, I'll slip under it and I'll throw. In if fact, I, there's a segment I did in the video that covers using the drop step as a slip. Uh, so Vesper, could you cue that up for, I think it's the, what did I call that? The head evasion or the... It's one of the last uh, drop step head dodge. That's the hop. Yep. The head dodge. So this is the slip using the feet. This is how I would use a drop step in terms of, of defense. I'll put you in the same spot. Typical uh, a snap is going to come to this quarter of the head. So if I drop off the line and I now use a level change, I'm going to lower my head from where it was as the, the sword comes in this way. I'm just going to let my head drop underneath it. This means I'm not just pressing my shield up to get it in the way of of, uh, his sword coming to my head, but I'm actually using the drop underneath, and now I would have a clear path to throw a counter blow. So same thing, if I shift onto this foot to come underneath, I'll be late, and I'm gonna catch it right in the head. But if from here as he comes in, I just drop down, and I drop my head off the line of that Sword strike, very good chance that you're not gonna get hit. Of course, you wanna tighten up the the angle by bringing yourself behind your shield if you have a shield, or maybe getting the sword up as well to cover it. At any rate, the main thing that will get you out of the way and that will leave your sword not necessarily committed, so you could actually use it as a counter strike, is to use that drop and level change. 
This means you have to, thank you, Perry. This means you have to be, have pretty well conditioned legs. Be comfortable dropping down into a kind of a crouch position in your armor. Train this up and condition yourself to do this. Get used to whether you can do it. Get comfortable lowering down and being able to shift and take your body weight. Use gravity in your favor. It's a really great tool. It really uh, manages energy very well. And so use it. Drop step, fantastic tool. Thank you for watching. Good pause. One of the hardest things, and I mentioned this kind of in the middle of the video, and I'll upload this video onto Coach's Corner so everybody can review it from top to bottom, but you, it's counterintuitive to think I'm going to use my feet to move my head. It's easy to think I'm going to duck my head and turn it around. Well, with a gorget, helmet, armor, that's high energy to do that. But if you use your feet, as you could see, it, was, it didn't take a lot of energy to let my body drop down by just picking one foot up. So it's an easy way to keep your energy expenditure low, slip that head and the helmet out of the way and be able to be loaded for a counter strike. And what I showed in the video was going to the uh, offside facing somebody who's uh, the same hand as that you are, where I used to use this a lot was with a leg shot. So I would sink down to that. I do the exact same motion to the other side I'd get out of the way of the, of the incoming blow very easily and I'd drop down and I would force my opponent into a devil's choice. When he saw me drop, either he'd lower his shield down to cover the body drop that he saw and he left his helmet open and I would just throw a snap to the helmet or he would turn and protect the helmet and he'd leave his leg open and I was low enough that it was just a very easy shot. And Odds wise, it was so much in my favor. Literally, that was one of my bread and butter maneuvers. I, I'd use it all the time because it just, it put the odds so much in my favor in terms of defense and offense. And yeah, and I think- Ford can probably uh, yeah. attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> way, way too much. Way too much. So uh, if you notice in that video, again, he drops into that power space. And, and that allows also to change the angle of your sword. So now you're lower, you create a, a harder angle for your opponent to block. Mm -hmm. And because his body is still straight, he has opportunity to still change that shot. Mm -hmm. So that's what creates those options for him. If he were to drop and lean, he has one shot. Mm -hmm. And I see this a lot. I see people step and then lean over to hit a leg. Mm -hmm. You're at that point, you've pretty much made one decision. Uh, there are some like, some great people out there that can change up stuff uh, because their bodies are, are they have a lot of dynamic in their body, but fundamentally, they they still have to do something to create something else. So he just by doing those things is, is again body straight, knees are bent. He's still in the position where he wants to be that his defense and offense are going to be the same. So his angle is the same, but his opponent's is different now. So you're creating a lot of great opportunity with, like you said, very little effort because we're learning how to use motion to break people down, you know? So, so don't, you know, it's, it, it, we're talking a lot about steps and things like that, but that's, that's not it. There, there's, there, they're shifting up and down, which changes that's, that's motion and movement as well. And that changes targeting areas. You'll see that when I go through the Lomachenko video uh, replay uh, in a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's a lot of these, these motions and movements that build your fight. And, and that's why it's, that's why the, the movement is so important. It's, it's the foundation on how you build your fight. We, you know, we have a bad habit of, we'll walk and we'll, we'll, in fact, we have a bad habit of just walking up to people, standing straight in front of them, throwing stuff. Now it's just whoever's better at defense whoever is more powerful, you know, we, we learn that all the time. Hey, I'm a little guy. What do I got to do? I got to move. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I had a big guy. My squire was six, seven, mm -hmm. 300 some pounds, you know, bodybuilder or well, power lifter. And he used to squat almost as low as me. Sometimes he had giant legs. It was no effort for him. So he could throw stuff that was amazing. Mm -hmm. 
So, and his movement was, people are like, ah, don't let him do that because it scares you, right? It, don't be a big guy moving because that's, that's, you know, that, that is a scary place. And Tristan, you're not a small guy either. No. Right? You got height and lean. you can still move. Yep. yep. So, so understand that movement, you can do movement no matter what. So, and sometimes it takes, it, you, you, you have to be careful. Uh, knees are in that place, you know, because if you, if you have some knee issues, uh, you, if you look at that drop step that Tristan's throwing, when he steps out, his foot is still on the outside, you know, is that his knee is still on to the inside of his foot. So be careful. If you step out and your knee flows on the outside of your foot, that is a very vulnerable position. So that they, your step out should not angle your knee outside your foot. So be careful in those places. But you'll also find that you build by just practicing and doing drills in, in movement and things, you'll build all that fine motor control in your, in your body, in your lower body. And you can use that to manipulate your opponent. And you can use that to break down your opponent. You can use that to, to you know, essentially build energy, take energy away, create tension in your opponent. That's, that's where that game is. And, and feet, you know, you have to be able to get in those places and you have to be able to do it fast or slow and change the speed in which you're doing it. And at all times, being able to be in your perfect defense and offense in that space. So, um, you know, those just some of the little things, you know, those are, those, you know, I, I don't want to jump into real advanced topics, but most of what we're talking about isn't necessarily advanced topics here. So if you do, but on a, on a side note, if you do have bad knees, work, you know, talk to your doctor, see what you can do, what you can't do. Uh, you'll probably find that he'll tell you that, hey, here's the exercises that you should be doing. And a lot of times they're the same things you probably should be doing in the SCA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you should be dropping into your knees a little bit and doing some shifts to build, slowly build that strength back in your legs. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever I, I go through a half day footwork class, when I go out and train uh, at events or at a weekend practice or something at that, I tell you, most people are like, hate me after they're done because they're in crouch all the time. A whole half you days. Know, in, in you know, Bronis, we all hate you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes me feel better. <laughs> but I, and I want to say, and this is a great point because when when you think about conditioning your legs, people think I just need to go to the, the gym and do a bunch of squats, or I need to get on the squat rack and I need to go down. Start out small. Get to the point where you feel how far can you drop before your body starts saying I don't trust my legs anymore, and you'll. Even if you do it slow, if you start to drop down and, and say you're sitting into your blow or sitting into your punch and you feel your legs start to shake a little bit or the knees collapse in a little bit, just get used to dropping like 10% down and back up to where you're comfortable. 10% down and then, and then get used to that and then go down 15%. Drop a little farther and just drop a little farther and drop a little farther. Try it out of armor, then try it in armor because in armor is going to be under a greater load. Don't just go nuts and start looking like an Olympic power lifter in your gym because all you're going to do is tear your body up. There, there are ways that you can gradually get into it. And there, there's, there's two great phrases to, to come away with this whole thing that, that I use with my students all the time. And one is a Brooksism, and he was a, a hockey coach, and he said, the legs feed the wolf. It is the legs that is going to win your fight. So always remember that. And the second one comes from a, a, a mid-realm Duke Comar, and, and I love this quote so much. And he said, it's a sad set of feet that lets your ass take a beating. Get your feet to move your body to a place that you are safer. Remember this, if you, if you face up on your pal and you turn 20 degrees or 25 degrees and you try to hit the opposite side, how difficult is it? It's kind of a pain in the ass, isn't it? Much less you turn 40 degrees off and you try to hit a cross your power gets lost. Well, now turn yourself into the Pell. Go to that place where it's harder for your opponent to deliver power to you. It doesn't take much to, to take to get out of the power range of your opponent. But for, for all that's holy, don't just walk straight into it and give your head to that person that's got a great snapshot or a, a, good, uh, a good offense. Go around to the outside and use your footwork to get you there. When you get there, have be like Tia Ward was talking about, have a stance that you can either take another step and another step and another step, or have a good position where you can throw a shot from there. And this is where 
kind of that devil's choice is when I would do my drop step out to one side, I'd give my opponent the, the opportunity to do one of three things. He'd either overturn because he was panicked that I was going around him. He wouldn't turn enough or he didn't turn at all. And I would have an easy wrap shot to his leg or to his back or to his butt, or he would turn just right. Well, two out of the three of those is in my favor. And if he turns just right, there's nothing to say that I can't step the opposite way and make him make that choice again. Either he overturns that way, he underturns, or he turns just right. Either way, I'm, he's having to respond to my movement. The more he responds to my movement, the more I control that whole interaction. And so that's where you want to turn the fight in your favor by being assertive, not necessarily aggressive, but put the pressure on that Bronis talks about. And you do that through the footwork. Keyword, do you, do you have uh, anything that uh, you'd like to kind of chime in with? You've been, been a great uh, guest and listening a lot, so you get front row. <laughs> yeah, um, it's kind of like standing behind in court. You got the best seat in the house. Um, yeah, being on the receiving end of Tristan's three choices and choosing poorly many times. Uh, and the other thing that 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 does is you're not using all your energy as you're sliding around, but they are changing their momentum. So they're burning more energy. Their stress has goes higher, right? Cause they know they're in a bad spot. So from that energy conference conservation point of view, when you're doing this nice smooth movement and forcing them to do their, to do a defensive move, you're burning them out faster. It's kind of like your grace you had been saying before is that I put pressure on, make you tense, and then then I'll watch you burn your energy and, and burn out. But yeah, footwork is, is amazing. And the whole movement, I do a lot of head slips too, and, and you can bleed off so much energy. But the whole movement and, and staying ready to move is huge. And it's not just footwork, like you were saying, it's, it's everything. It's being able to just use gravity because it doesn't, you don't burn energy using letting gravity pull you down out of a shot. But yeah. I also remember as an intermediate fighter, one of the big indicators that said that my footwork sucked was when I'd see an opportunity that an opening that my opponent gave me and I was not in a position to take advantage of it. And I'd see it go by and like, look at that gap. That gap was huge. I could have had a shot in there, but I wasn't in a position to do it. And that tell, told me, clean up the footwork, get the posture right so that you're coiled and ready to go at any moment. And, and so if you're an intermediate fighter and you're, and you're seeing opportunities that you can't get to, chances are it's your footwork and your posture that is holding you back. And that's where addressing it's uh, probably going to be the next thing for you to go through. Um, so, you know, again, understand at any given time, you guys are welcome to ask questions. Um, we really love questions because it helps to make the show better for us. So Absolutely. Uh, if you have anything, go ahead and, and put it out there. Um, we will probably be following up with show another, at least another more advanced footwork, uh, talk, which is going to probably talk a little bit more about things that you can do, uh, like a jab foot, which I use in boxing, um, uh, uh, you know, angles, how to create angles, uh, what angles do for you, uh, those up and downs that we were talking about and putting pressure on the up and down side, the use of motion or in movement to create tension and how to break your opponent down into tension. Uh, they were talked about, you know, uh, making somebody, you know, create a defense, you know, remember that if your opponent has to do something to think about defense, you're freeing yourself of him being offensive for a second. And that's, that's free time for you. So in other words, that free time can be used two ways. One is can be used to take advantage of and throw a shot uh, that you know something's not going to come back from. Or it could be used as a resting point. In other words, pull them into a defense and slide, change your angle behind their shield. Now you have two shields in front of you. you he's in a wrong angle to throw a blow like Tristan was talking about earlier if you look at a Pell. And now you have a place where you can relax and breathe 
Uh, and, and then, you know, the, the things we don't talk about a lot is uh, just like running or anything else. There's a lot of breath control inside of movement as well. There's a lot of tension and breath control that, that you can control. And if you can pull your opponent into places that they can't do that, then slowly you're burning them out. It's, you know, I, I use the runner's idea about this. And that is, you know, I, I'm, I'm in a run, I'm running and the guy's next to me. And then I, I know I'm going to increase my pace. And he's like, guy next to me is like, oh, I got to increase my pace. So he starts increasing his pace. I know when I can slowly decrease my pace so that he doesn't know it and reduce my heart rate, get my breath back. And then at some point he goes, hey, wait, I know what this guy's doing. And then he drops off to try to fix the problem that was just created. And then at that point, I can increase my pace a little bit again. And, and now he's playing catch up with me and I'm controlling him. So it all comes, you know, all of these things can happen inside of, you know, if you have good movement, you can make those things happen and, and break an opponent down just piece by piece. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and if people like the video that I put up, I think uh, I'd like to do one on the pendulum step because I think that's going to be one that offers a ton of flexibility for being able to move, especially circle and move without ever crossing over. And I can describe the way I learned learned this really from a breakdown standpoint is from Savat, uh, which is a French uh, kickboxing art, goes back to the 1700s. And when you bring your feet together, you can go every direction. And that kind of options uh, availability to be able to go anywhere makes you unpredictable. And that's a great asset to have. So um, we can talk, I think that'd be one of those more in-depth uh, topics that we have for getting deeper into, into the, the intricacies of the footwork. Um, I consider it a fundamental, but it's uh, one of those that's so far away from what is instinctual in terms of moving but boy, it's profound on what it will let you do uh, when you start to get it down. So we got about 10 minutes or a little under 10 minutes. Um, and uh, I just wanna make sure everybody knows if you do have other things that you would like to, us to cover or had questions, uh, Coach's Corner's out there, uh, put it out there because we're looking for subjects all the time. We have, we have a whole spreadsheet of subjects still. Uh, I'm gonna be adding another half a dozen things to it coming up here. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if somebody comes up to something, we can't, you know, we're not thinking everything for everybody. So if you come up with something good, there's a good chance that we'll, we'll go through that and, uh, and, and really, uh, you know, hopefully that, that pays off for the other people that are, you know, listening out there. Also, the, you know, I just saw it last week after the last uh, Coach's Corner. Um, if you want to reach out to any one of the teachers and, you know, talk with them or like, Hey, I don't want to post my video of me doing this because it's embarrassing online and I don't want to get the criticism online. Don't be free to go ahead and ping, you know, any one of the coaches that are in the coach's corner uh, that, you know, that, that you listen to that maybe grabbed your attention and they're more than willing to go ahead and review video and, and, and talk with you and try to help you. Um, or at least give you some resources that maybe you can go and take a look and, and educate yourself even more on. Uh, I know I spend a lot of time, uh, usually at the beginning of my I practice twice a week still. Um, I'm lucky enough to, to, to have some people that I stayed in, in contact with uh, from the beginning and still keeping distancing from everyone else. But uh, So we do a lot of video of questions like, hey, how do you do this? Or, hey, I'm fighting this guy, this is what's happening. What can I do better? And then, so I'll go through and we'll shoot little videos and pops of, of, okay, here's what, think about it this way. And this is what I do to handle that situation. That way they, you kind of have a better feel for, um, you know, maybe something to try when you are in a fight uh, against someone like that. So, and, uh, uh, you know, obviously we, we have a couple of people that have, uh, uh, done some, uh, we, we've covered some stretching and training and uh, injury prevention and things like that. So um, we're more than happy to try to help where we can, or, or at least guide you to the people that can hopefully help you. So uh, we look forward to uh, lots more shows and uh, we're trying to make them best for you. I see we do have one late question in, and I think this is worth addressing with this show because it, it fits in so well. And that says, uh, the question is, I'm a smaller fighter. How do you equalize a fight? <laughs> And I've found that if you're a smaller fighter, doing it with strength ain't going to work. Nope. 
Doing it with movement, however, is very beneficial. Um, so focusing on, on the footwork and being able to be elusive. Uh, if you're smaller, you do not want to engage strength. Uh, you usually don't want to engage speed either. Uh, and we talked uh, about this in depth at a, in a previous episode where don't, you don't want to outspeed a speed fighter um, for a number of reasons. But with good footwork, you can manage your energy and kind of make them chase you down. As a shorter fighter, you have an advantage of less target area. Um, and and uh, as a, I'm six foot four, so I, I'm not the one to speak of exactly how to, as a smaller fighter, uh, overcome taller fighters. But I will tell you that uh, there are shorter fighters that have found ways to make sure that they can equalize that height advantage. And, and one of them is to stay moving. It is, it's the basic principle. Anything that's moving is harder to hit. Plain and simple. That's a fundamental of all combat. Uh, whereas if you sit still, you're going to be vulnerable. And so the footwork is the way to get that, do that with the most efficiency. Um, and, you know, I learned some great stuff from Branis about how, you know, because I'm taller than he is and he would always take me to school. So I'm like, all right, well, what are you doing to do that? And, and it usually came down to movement. Everything was about movement and movement is built on footwork. Um, obviously it's a little too, too in depth to go into troubleshooting, you know, your specific issue, but keep those feet churning away, keep them moving around, kind of make them turn to face you, make them adjust to where you, your new position is, make them hit a moving target. And uh, this is where smaller people and people that are built like I am, I'm an ectomorph, so I'm, I'm lean. We have less muscle mass. So as moving around is easier on us, easier on our yeah. bodies. And so you use that to your advantage. Yeah. Um, make the bigger fighter with a lot more muscle mass, use his muscles to move himself around to, to keep after you. And you don't have to run away like you're turning them into chasing you. But you do want to make them turn, shift. Don't, don't just walk straight up to them. That'll, that'll be kind of the worst thing that you could do. Um, Brownus, maybe you've got some other, other yeah. advice. Yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm not a giant guy either. Um, and uh, I'm you know, about 5'9". Um, and uh, really, movement was critical in, in what I did a lot. And that, that becomes, uh, like Tristan says here, it takes when you're when you have a lot of muscle and you have a lot of weight that takes energy in your body to to move um and you don't you it's 100 right you don't have to run away like you're just constantly running but in fact what you want to do is you want to put constant tension on your opponent just at the edge where it's like inviting them and if if he wants to run at you then go ahead and run away run back just at it at that edge because probably you're still faster than them mm -hmm. until he realizes he's not going to catch up and then as soon as he realizes he's not going to catch up and he slows down and is ready to stop, that's at the point where you can pop and throw something quick and move, mm -hmm. right? So you, there's all kinds of opportunities in those places. The trick is understanding them and using them in the, in the proper times. And the way we do that is we constantly push into our opponent and evaluate their, their defense, evaluate their offense, evaluate their speed. And we do all of that in a fight so that we can figure out how we're going to win. If we don't take that time and I'm like, I'm going to stand in front of you and I'm going to throw a shot and find out that he's faster than you are, then you're going to lose. But if you stand there and you, you fake a shot and then all of a sudden you throw something, you pick it up. It's like, oh, he's faster than I am. I got to do something different. Right. So so that's part of that. What we use movement for. We use movement to evaluate our opponent. In other words, the same thing happens. I might push really hard on one side, get get my energy up where I'm controlling it. I'm like, I want to see them start huffing and puffing because as soon as he starts huffing and puffing then i know that i can break him down mentally as well because mm -hmm. as soon as he starts huffing and puffing i'll i'll relax for a second give him a second like to, to make him feel like he can breathe and then i'll push that tension really hard on him and capture that bad air inside of him mm -hmm. and now now it's really breaking him down mentally he's starving uh, for air and he's thinking about breathing more than he's even sometimes thinking about you and in fact they'll go in panic mode and they'll start throwing just to try to end the fight. And when anybody does that, they are weak. Mm -hmm. So you, there's a lot of, lot of things. Footwork, yeah, you, when you use your footwork to make them take the long way to get to you, 
and just by being elusive, make them travel a long distance and make those big muscles pump a lot of blood. And, and I used to do the same thing you're talking about. I, I'd wait for that huffing and puffing. And then I was like, I'm going to give you about three or four seconds. And now it's time to turn it on. <laughs> yep. And, 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 you know, because even as big as I am, you know, in the mid run, we had some big fighters. Oh yeah. Massive. And, um, you know, but I was, even though I was tall, I was right. elusive enough that I'd make them chase me for a couple of minutes first, you know? And if you're smaller, use that, use that advantage. Yep. I Be sure did. Pretty evasive. Um, and the footwork is how you get all that. All right. I, I, can I all add right. something that, yeah, to please. that? Being, being the five foot six guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm short at five, nine. I'm like, I wish. <laughs> um, one thing you'll have to learn is patience because you really, really want to know your range and be patient at your range. So as, as his grace said, you know, when you add tension and read your, read your opponent when, if they tense up, like they're going to throw a blow, fade back out and just keep doing that until, like they said, uh, you see them struggling a little to breathe, then you can dart in longer, come out, but it's all about the movement and patience, keep at range, and wait for them to make the mistake. All right, well, we got nine o'clock. It's been a great yeah. show. It's been wonderful having everybody here. We will be back with the Coach's Corner in the very near future, but for everybody that would like to head over there, in the meantime, I encourage you to do that. Make sure you join, like their page, get involved. They're wonderful people, wonderful knowledge, um, and I will post a link to that uh, right after this show. Any and I will post words? up a, a, the link to the video uh, that I showed about the drop step and the spring step. Um, in, in a follow-up, if you are listening to this recorded, please feel free to post up a question on the Coach's Corner Facebook page afterwards. Or if you're not on Facebook, you can do it on the YouTube um, replay of this. You can ask in the in the comment section. So we're easy to get a hold of. Get a hold if you have questions. We're happy to help. And Vesper, as you know, we we owe you uh, a huge debt of gratitude for uh, making all of this happen, helping everybody in the society um, uh, get educated and get knowledge even if that knowledge is learning to know somebody a little better um, uh, I, I think it makes our society better every day well, thank you Vesper. thank you thank you guys oh, absolutely thank you Vesper. Well, thank you for taking the time to share all of that knowledge because this would not be possible without you all. So thank you for being here. I look forward to seeing you all in the very near future. All right. We'll do. Have a good night. Have thank you, everybody. Night. Bye.